Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and you're listening to the ninth episode of my series on the Hermetica. So if you are brand new to this series, I suggest starting at episode one and listening all the way through each episode consecutively because the concepts in each episode really sort of build on one another. You could watch any of the episodes as a standalone, uh, but I think that uh, you'll really get the most out of it by taking in the entire series. Um, in this episode, we are working on two chapters, Death and Immortality and Ignorance of the Soul. So these two chapters will be the focus for us today. Now I'm going to go ahead and share a presentation on the screen so you can follow along. Um, now, the purpose of this series is to give students of, astrolo of astrology an introduction to hermetic philosophy and its relation to the spiritual practice of astrology. Um, why? Because ancient Hellenistic authors, our source texts for Western astrology, tell us that the legendary founder of astrology was Hermes Trismegistus. So, of course, it would make sense to study the oldest known philosophy that is also attributed to Hermes, most of which pertains directly to the zodiac, to the planets, and um, their relation to the soul and to the process of the transmigration of the soul, to enlightenment, to things like that. Um, we're working our way through a text called The Hermetica by um, Timothy Freck and Peter Gandy. I really recommend picking up a copy if you're going to go through. It's not that thick of a book. It's really easy to follow, and it takes a huge amount of dense philosophical dialogues and treatises attributed to Hermes and condenses them into easy uh, topical chapters that are in prose poetry form. So it's really beautiful, very accessible, good for beginners. Um, and it's published by Tartar Cornerstone, which I have a little soft spot for because um, they published my first book about ayahuasca. Um, also, they uh, do a really nice, um, Tartar Cornerstones has a nice edition of the Tao Te Ching that I really like. And the Cornerstone Editions books are, are they're good pickups overall. So at any rate, um, it's very important to look at uh, the foundational philosophy of astrology because what we, re we really want to know is why are we doing astrology? What's the spiritual basis of astrology? What beliefs did ancient astrologers have? Sometimes we treat astrology like it's just some kind of technology. And uh, that really wasn't the intention of the ancient astrologers. So the purpose of this series is also to help us connect with the spiritual roots and having a spiritual intention when we approach astrology is, is a good idea. Now, inevitably, you'll see that there's a lot of connection between Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy throughout this series. So you, you'll notice that. That is not a coincidence. Uh, the birth of astrology really comes from the melting pot of the Persian occupation of Babylon in the middle of the um, last millennium BCE. And uh, there was a confluence of its historians have, of all walks of life have told us that there is there was a great confluence of thinkers, scholars, mystics, you know, scientists, etc. And so you'll find that a lot that's in the Hermetica is very similar to things that you'll find in yoga philosophy, in uh, the Puranas, in the Vedas, and things like that, the Upanishads. So at any rate, um, I hope that you enjoy this series. And today's two topics, again, we're looking at are um, the <clears throat> here we go, death and immortality and ignorance of the soul. So I'm going to read each chapter out loud, and then we'll reflect on the various points in the chapter together. And the reason that this is important is because ancient astrologers transmitted things orally. So when you read the original hermetic texts, most of them are dialogues, which means that you're getting to read a conversation conversations between students and teachers where a student is in a receptive position getting to hear and getting to listen. Um, the reason that they're presented in that way is because what you're getting to see in the written dialogue is the kinds of questions that a, a student might have for a teacher and that a teacher might give in response. So you kind of get to become the student in the dialogues. The dialogues are really dense, however, and difficult to follow in some ways. And so what I love about this edition is that it breaks it down into really manageable sections, but I still want to read them out loud for you so that you can actually hear the rhythm of the text and uh, 
enter into the mood of Hermes as he's teaching. So this is on death and immortality. We'll start there. The end of becoming is the beginning of destruction. The end of destruction is the beginning of becoming. Everything on earth must be destroyed. For without destruction, nothing can be created. The new comes out of the old. Every birth of living flesh, like every growth of crop from seed, will be followed by destruction. But from decay comes renewal. Through the circling course of the celestial gods and the power of nature, who has her being in the being of Atum. For man, time is a destroyer but for the cosmos, it is an ever-turning wheel. These earthly forms that come and go are illusions. How can something be real which never stays the same? But these transitory, illusory things arise from the underlying permanent reality. Birth is not the beginning of life, only of an individual awareness. Change into another state is not death only the ending of this awareness. Most people are ignorant of the truth and therefore afraid of death, believing it to be the greatest of all evils. But death is only the dissolution of a worn out body. Our term of service as guardians of the world is ended when we are freed from the bonds of this mortal frame and restored, cleansed and purified to the primal condition of our higher nature. After quitting the body, mind, which is divine by nature, is freed from all containment. Taking on a body of light, it ranges through all space, leaving the soul to be judged and punished according to its deserts. Souls do not all go to the same place, nor to different places at random. Rather, each is allocated to a place that fits its nature. When a soul leaves the body, it undergoes a trial and investigation by the chief of the gods. When he finds a soul to be honorable and pure, he allows it to live in a region that corresponds to its characteristics. But if he finds it stained with incurable ignorance, he hurls it down to the storms and whirlwinds where it is eternally tossed between sky and earth on the billowing air. Only a good soul is spiritual and divine. Having wronged no one and come to know Atum, such a soul has run the race of purity and becomes all mind. After it leaves its physical form, it becomes a spirit in a body of light, so that it may serve Atum. At the dissolution of the body, first the physical form is transformed and is no longer visible. The vital spirit returns to the atmosphere. The bodily senses go back to the universe and recombine in new ways to do other work. Then the soul mounts upwards through the structures of the heavens. In the first zone, it is relieved of growth and decay. In the second, evil and cunning. In the third, lust and deceiving desire. In the fourth, domineering arrogance. In the fifth, unbalanced audacity and rashness. In the sixth, greed for wealth. In the seventh, deceit and falsehood. Having been stripped of all that was put upon it by the structures of the heavens, the soul now possesses its own proper power and may ascend to the eighth sphere, rejoicing with all those that welcome it and singing psalms to the Father. The gods that dwell above the eighth sphere sing praises with a voice that is theirs alone. Call each soul to surrender to the gods and so each one becomes itself a god by entering communion with Atum. This is primal goodness. This is the consummation of true knowledge, having been initiated into immortality. A human soul, now transformed into a god, joins the gods who dance and sing in celebration of the glorious victory of the soul. So this is another super vivid and really beautiful passage from Hermes. And uh, let's take a look at it. In this chapter, um, Hermes sets out to describe the cycle of birth and death as well as the immortality of the soul. So this is really important because sometimes we think that it's only Eastern concepts like um, that, that basically that things like reincarnation, karma, enlightenment, that they only exist in the East and they're sort of 
imported or brought to the West because, you know, our philosophy is bereft of such concepts. But actually, we see that in by, you know, the, t- the time of the founding of Western astrology, these concepts are clearly being shared uh, across a wide region by a lot of different cultures, Egypt, India, um, the Mesopotamian, Babylonian region. It's arguable that even the Jewish culture had certain kinds of beliefs in reincarnation. So <clears throat> not that I'm an expert in all of these things, but um, it's important because in this chapter, Hermes is really describing for us transmigration of the soul uh, and the cycle of death and rebirth. He tells us that the end of becoming is the beginning of destruction and the end of destruction is the beginning of becoming and that this is how the material universe works. So insofar as we are human beings in bodies, in flesh, in the material universe, this is the way that things are. It could have been a page right out of the the, uh, Tao Te Ching. It could have been a page right out of the I Ching um, that the Cosmos is a cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death, creation and destruction over and over again. Now, this is said to come from the circling course of the celestial gods, the planets, <clears throat> and the power of nature who has her being in the being of Atom. So, <clears throat> we've covered this in previous chapters, but you can see it where the, um, the idea is that the cycle of birth and death creation and destruction that we see in the material universe is reflected in terms of the constant cyclings of the planets. And that we also see this in an elemental sense in nature. So in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, Krishna talks about the three modes of material nature, the gunas, uh, sattva gun, raja gun, and tamas, you know, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And, or you could think about the four elements or the five elements. So there's these forces of nature along with the sort of order uh, the, the higher ordering of the cosmos that governs these cycles and the fluctuations of these cycles uh, in the planets. So <clears throat> Hermes tells us that for mankind, time is a destroyer. And that, you know, like as insofar as we are identified with our bodies, we experience time, uh, which, you know, seems to us to move from past, present, and future, even though, again, it's a, it's a big circle. Uh, so it's it's both linear and circular at the same time. That we experience time as a destroyer. Uh, in same thing in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, time I am d- the destroyer of worlds. So um, the uh, earthly forms that come and go in this world through these cycles, Hermes says, are an illusion uh, because they don't last. But he says even though these transitory things arise uh, and disappear, they are coming from, they all have their essence in an underlying permanent reality. So that's why we say that, you know, there's something called the transmigration of the soul, that even though you are in a body and your body will die, that does not mean that you will die. It means that your body will fall off. That's the basic idea. And the same thing is that's really that's being said here that's really interesting philosophically is that much like Plato, that this world is in one sense an illusion, but in another sense it's a reflection of spiritual diversity that exists in a spiritual or more ideal or archetypal realm where things are uh, there's permanence to things and yet there's still diversity, and that's very very important because sometimes. People want to take this kind of statement from Hermes about transitory illusory things and the kind of dualities of the world, creation and destruction. And they want to say, yeah, it's all duality. We know it's, you know, that's all fake. It's all an illusion. Everything's just oneness. That is not what Hermes is telling us. Um, So in order to understand the sophistication of the idea of oneness that's being presented in the Hermetica or by Plato or in, in texts like the Bhagavad Purana, um, in in the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> we have to understand that <clears throat> that there is a simultaneous and inconceivable oneness and differentiation that exists. So we've said this in so many chapters already in this series, but the idea is that um, you never lose your autonomy and uniqueness as a soul. Uh, it was never created; it can never be destroyed. Uh, that as a soul, you are not God but you are also of the exact same essence as God. And therefore the 
picture of enlightenment that's presented is never one of merging into total oneness and ridding ourselves of any form of separation, distinction, or unique difference. The thing that Hermes presents to us, or the image that Hermes presents to us of enlightenment, as we'll find as we go along, is not, it, it doesn't look like that. It does not look like a picture of, uh, you know, uh, loss of differentiation, loss of individuality, or loss of diversity. So it's, you know, on one, in one sense, the trees, the birds, the flowers, the sun, they're all different things. And, uh, you know, in one sense, because they're all made up of the same essence, the appearance as though they're all different things is an illusion, right? Uh, so some people leap from there to say, well, everything must be just one then. There is no, there is no such thing really as a sun or it's, it's all just one. Yes, on one level, Hermes tells us the same thing. It's all just one. But it's also different, right? So you can think of it like, uh, you can think of it like the, the heat of a fire and the flames of a fire. If you, uh, uh, you can feel the heat of a fire by standing close to it and put, putting your hand near the flames, right? The heat emanates from the flames. But if you touch the flames, it's a very different experience. The, the two are inseparable. You can't separate uh, the emanation of heat from, from fire, and just in a basic an, uh, analogy here. So similarly, the, the universe, uh, each of us as individual spirit souls can't be separated from our source. In that sense, we're one. The heat and the fire can't ever really be separated, but the heat and the fire are distinct things. We can have distinct experiences of them. So that's what's meant by Hermes throughout this entire book as well, is that the entire uh, treatises that we're looking at here, we're talking about spiritual enlightenment, not as something where you lose some kind of individuality and everything just merges into you know, one pure light or something like that. Uh, there is still differentiation. That's very, very important, as you'll see. So birth, he says, is not the beginning of life, only of an individual awareness. Change into another state is not death, only the ending of an individual awareness. So sometimes people will also mistake this to mean that individual awareness is an illusion. That is not what Hermes is saying. Hermes is saying that insofar as you are an individual spirit soul and you come into a body, that what we think of as birth in this material world is only the beginning of the consciousness, you, of a particular form, your body. And then when your individual consciousness dies, it's not really death, it's only the change of, the, of what you are conscious of. You will be conscious, in other words, of a different form. The forms change in relation to what we are as souls, who we are, how we're changing as souls, what we desire as souls, etc. This is why our forms change and our karma shifts from one lifetime to another. Hermes says that most people are ignorant of the truth of our eternal nature and therefore they are very afraid of death. And they live their whole lives based on the idea of trying to live forever, trying to stay young, trying to be powerful, trying to protect against death because we, we cling to the illusion of this temporary form being eternal when it's not. He says that our terms of service expire when we're free from our mortal bonds and cleansed and purified to the primal condition of our higher nature. So our higher nature is, um, our, our true nature is always with us in every form that we are in, but it's covered, like smoke can cover a fire, um, or the, um, you know, like the, the costume that an actor wears on a stage. Um, when we leave our body, he says, and we've reached a stage of enlightenment, so to speak, um, the mind or what Hermes would say as a sort of the spirit soul or the, um, the consciousness is separated from the body and uh, takes on a body of light, allowing it to travel freely. So you see, it's not that there is, again, merging into some total oneness at the end of all of this. It's the taking on of what's sometimes generally referred to as a light body, which is a, a spiritual body. The soul is left according to be judged, uh, judged according to its deserts. So this is very interesting because um, you know, th there's another process that happens, which is where the soul uh, will be judged and will reincarnate. 
Souls do not all go to the same place, nor to different places at random, but to each it's allocated, uh, to each is allocated a place that fits its nature. So in astrology, we have the same idea, the moon, the lot of fortune, the hermetic lots in general, um, houses from fortune, zodiacal releasing, the birth chart itself, all are ways of looking very generally at what one has been allocated according to the karma of one's soul, the nature of one's soul, its past actions, its current disposition, its desires, fears, etc. When a soul leaves the body, and it's not it's not taking on a spiritual body. It goes under a trial and investigation. It's basically judged and judged fairly too. This is not like, you know, you're not going into some, uh, you know, it's not like a, a bad acid trip, you know, a courtroom with the judge from the, the, the Pink Floyd video, <laughs> or the wall. It's not, it's not like that. The idea is that you're judged fairly. Your, your life is looked at in terms of what you tried to cultivate spiritually, how you led your life, um, how you treated others, what you cultivated, uh, what virtues you, you developed, etc. A pure soul that is honorable goes to a region that corresponds to its characteristics. Um, so uh, you may go to a, um, a more heavenly place, and there are innumerable places that you can reincarnate. It's implied here. And if stained with ignorance, the soul will go into a cloudy, stormy place tossed to and fro. In other words, you'll be put into a situation where it'll be hard to see. That's the implication because cloudy and stormy place means you can't see clearly and there's a lot of tumultuousness. So the general way that you could define, and Hermes has mentioned this previous, in previous chapters we've studied as well, is that what you, could previous, uh, what you could say about an intelligent soul is that it will consistently get lifetimes which are more conducive to seeing clearly its own nature and to... Um, uh, ascending into knowledge of its communion with the divine, uh, which d- develops in the heart. It's it's a it's not just a, a mental knowing. It's a it's, it's a it's an intimacy that that grows right, uh, like a relationship that's deepening. Um, on the other hand, the soul that's stained with ignorance will be put into a situation that deepens the cl- the clouding effect. This is both a kind of punishment, but also it's really kind of a form of therapy and treatment for a sick soul. Um, And through those experiences, the sense of needing to know the truth, of needing help, of needing a light, of needing a way out of chaos or tumultuousness grows in the soul, right? There's nothing that's worse for us in some ways than a lot of cushy, comforting scenarios that keep us uh, lukewarm and not at all in need of... um, any kind of spiritual growth or development because we're, we're just comfortable. So that, that this is, it sounds a little intense, but all you have to do is look at people that you've known or look at yourself when you've been in your most ignorant places in life and just, you know, be honest. Does, does the description not fit very, you know, fits pretty well. If you think about it, it's the, it's a stormy place. It's a place where you can't really see where you're going, where you're, you're being thrown about by a lot of passions and desires So Hermes says, only a good soul is spiritual and divine. Having wronged no one and come to know Atum, such a soul has run the race of purity and become all mind. In other words, all spiritual consciousness. And then takes on a body of light with which it may serve Atum. This is very important because, again, the picture of enlightenment is not one that says, oh, do away with all distinctions. Some people say, yeah, it's it's all duality. It's all just an illusion. There's no, everything's just one. But then notice what some of these people do with their lives. They, uh, w- when we say it's all just an illusion, it's all just one, sometimes that gives us an excuse to be incredibly self-indulgent. And sometimes it's even described in uh, certain yogic scriptures as a kind of uh, God delusion. Well, if everything's one, then I am God, right? Like that. And you're God. And like, let's just eye gaze for four hours or whatever that that this it can easily in other words it can easily devolve into um you know there was a lot of yogis for example when they came to the west during the 1960s that were very critical of the hippie culture which was like it's all love it's all good it's all god like like that um i'm not saying that they're you know i'm not trying to condemn the hippie culture right but there's something about uh, that idea that everything is one, that there are no distinctions, and that that you know you're God and I'm God and everything is God, 
and uh, everything is an illusion here that appears separate. Um, that is also a, a kind of ignorance and illusion as far as the Hermetica is concerned. And other texts too, like the Bhagavad Purana is very explicit about that. Um, so in this case, what Hermes is telling us is that when the soul is actually moving into enlightenment, it's happening as it's coming to know that it is a separate individual emanation of God, right? So it's like, uh, you know, like, 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 a, like a child coming to understand that it's a part of its parent, but it's also a unique being. It's like individuating, becoming our own spiritual selves. And what we naturally come to when we do that individuating <clears throat> is blissful, is eternal, is heavenly, but it's also, uh, it, it's, it's not collapsing or taking away relationship. For love to exist, there has to be lover and beloved, right? There's an exchange. So that exchange is maintained in the structure of Hermes. In his picture of enlightenment, uh, the soul, as it enlightens, becomes aware of the fact that it is a part, a separate part of the whole, and that as such, its nature is to serve the whole. How can the, you know, the hands serve the whole? Or how can the feet serve the whole? Or like that. So in this recognition, it becomes at one with the divine insofar as it can fulfill or perfect its role as a servant. And that the nature of that exchange of serving the whole is love. That's the communion that Hermes speaks about. <clears throat> He says that the dissolution of the body, the physical form is transformed and is no longer visible. The vital spirit returns to the atmosphere. The senses go back to the universe and recombine in new ways to do other work. This is like that kind of famous statement, you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be displaced. It can only transform. So everything that's made up, the subtle body, the senses, the physical components of our body, upon death when we leave and attain a spiritual body, they just go back into the material universe and they're recycled. But there's an implication there that's kind of interesting, which is this. The forms that you inhabit are basically all borrowed pre-existing material. If you ever looked at yourself and said, oh, I really look like my aunt or I look like my father or I look like, you know, it was that person kind of looks like a beaver or <laughs> something like that. Like this is not, these are, this is not, you're not, you're not wrong about that. You know what I mean? Um, the, everything that, that is making us up is borrowed material. It's re, it's being recycled all the time. And a lot of it will, will share in likeness and appearances and combinations and permutations of different archetypal forms that make up our parts. So, uh, they all go off and recombine, Hermes says. Then he says, the soul mounts upward through the structures of the heavens. And as it ascends, it's relieved of various vices. That's interesting. So we start shedding the, the, the kinds of things that keep us in ignorance as we go up through these celestial spheres, so to speak. And finally, the soul obtains its own unique nature or power. This is really interesting. So here it is. Now the soul, who has been in ignorance of its true self, obtains, retains, or gets, gets back to, however you want to think about it, its true nature. Like, this is who I really am. I don't need to take on different bodies and experiment with everything that I'm not any longer. Now I'm back to who I really am. And in that true form, we're in alignment with the whole. We're not exactly that. We're not the whole itself. We are part and parcel of the whole. We relate to the whole as a, as a servant, as an instrument. And then we join with heavenly beings who each have their own voice and a unique way of singing and praising God, which is to say of harmonizing with the whole, the way that you harmonize, the way that I harmonize, the way that we each obtain our true nature is uh, its final result is it, it expressed in terms of singing a unique song and uh, being part of the, the divine harmony of the whole. That's very beautiful. To me, I like that. I've always been drawn to that image much more than the idea of monism, where everything is just collapsed into one singular something. This picture says, yes, it's all a whole, but again, there's diversity and harmony among the constituent parts. So you can enjoy the bliss of being really, really you and not anyone else, which is beautiful but you're also simultaneously a servant of the whole of which you are a part. And that is what enables you to re realize who you are. 
So this is a, a, a very beautiful picture of heaven that Hermes is presenting us with. At any rate, so that's the end of the death and immortality chapter. Let's check out the next chapter, which is um, called <clears throat> Ignorance of the Soul. This one's kind of heavy, I'm warning you. <laughs> Ignorance of the Soul. It is impossible to be permanently happy while attached to a body. A man should train his soul in this life so that when he enters the other world where he is able to see a tum, he does not lose his way. Each soul's hope of eternal life rests in his life here on earth. But many cannot believe this, seeing it as an empty story to be laughed at. For the possessions of this life are too pleasant and such pleasures grip the soul by the throat, holding it down to earth. Our possessions possess us. We were not born with possessions, but acquired them later. Everything a man uses to gratify his body is alien to his original godlike nature. Not only possessions, even the body is foreign to our true self. The mind of the cosmos is known through thought alone. A soul with no inner vision is blind to Atum's goodness, tossed by the sea of passions which the body breeds. What fire burns like impurity? What hungry predator has the power to maim the body, as impurity does to mutilate the soul? Can't you see the torture that the impure soul endures? It shrieks, I am burning, I am on fire, I don't know what to say or do. I am devoured by the miseries that possess me. Are not such cries the appeals of a soul in torment? Such a soul bears the body like a burden as its master, not as its slave. Tear off this cloak of shadows, this web of ignorance, these shackles of decay, this living death, this conscious corpse, this portable tomb, this robber in the house, this enemy that hates all that you love, this garment that smothers you and holds you down. Ignorance floods the land. Its currents sweep you away. Don't be born downstream. Make use of the backflow. Seek the safe haven of liberation. Anchor there and find a guide to lead you to the house of knowledge. There you will see with the heart the brilliant brightness. If you shut your soul up in your body and demean yourself saying, I cannot know, I am afraid, I cannot ascend to heaven, then what have you to do with Atum? Wake up your sleeping soul. Why give yourselves to death when you could be immortal? You are drunk with ignorance of Atum. It has overpowered you and now you are vomiting it up. Empty yourselves of darkness and you will be filled with light. There is no greater mistake than to have the power to know Atum and not to use it. Simply wishing and hoping to know him is a road that leads straight to goodness. It is an easy road to travel. Everywhere Atum will come to meet you. Look and he appears at times and places when you least expect, while you are awake or asleep, when you travel by water or land, by night or by day, whilst you are speaking or silent. This is because Atum is all. <clears throat> Another very beautiful chapter, dark, but light at the end, which is, which is nice. So Hermes is now describing the ignorance of the soul and what we're supposed to do about it. So he says, first of all, it's po impossible to be permanently happy while we're attached to a body. Just don't try. Um, in, in the bodily sense, like you're not, while you're in physical form, like there's a story in the Bhagavat Purana about uh, a great elephant named Lord Gajendra. And Lord Gajendra is swimming in a lake in a heavenly planet with his family and friends. And he's kind of a big, big shot, former king, I think, in a past life. And uh, as he's swimming there and enjoying himself and thinking like this will last forever, a crocodile bites his leg. And uh, the crocodile, you know, bites his leg and um, he won't let go. And, you know, at first, uh, Gajendra's like, ah, you know, I'll just get him off. Like, I'm strong, I'm mighty, whatever. And if it doesn't work, and the crocodile bites harder. And, you know, over time, over a very long time, I think it's like 100 years or something, he struggles with this crocodile. And finally, he realizes, like, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to beat this thing. I'm not, I'm not going to get out of this. And at that point, only at that point, does, he, for the first time, he reach out. He says, I don't know what's out there, what goodness or what what divinity or what help exists out there, but please help me. This is an impossible situation. And if there is anything, please help. And at that time, <clears throat> basically Krishna descends on Garuda and 
uh, helps um, Lord Gajendra to be free from the crocodile. And he says, um, you didn't know who you were calling for, but you were calling for me. And so here I am and I'm helping you. And in the same way, Hermes really in this chapter uh, tells us that <clears throat> the ignorance of the soul will keep us locked in a body. And insofar as we are locked in a body, we're a lot like Gajendra struggling with the crocodile. Our senses have us. We're slaves, not masters of our desires, of our body, of our appetites, of our, you know, like this. This is why we're predictable, right? This is why, we're, you know, in the material universe, we incarnate into forms um, because we, we don't see ourselves as parts of the whole. We think of ourselves as separate. And so we go off trying to do things, achieve things, obtain things, consummate desires, thinking that it will provide us with satisfaction. Over time, we realize this is a losing fight. This is, this is not going well. It all ends in the same way. I have to say goodbye to everything. I have to give everything up. I start over, right? And let, so eventually we get exhausted. And then we start calling out something, anything. We start looking for knowledge of our true self, of true happiness. We, we start looking for anything of a higher nature. And Hermes says a man should train himself, his soul, so that when he enters the other world where he's able to see a tum, he does not lose his way. The other, the idea here is also that, um, you know, that when we are, um, uh, when we go into new bodies, new worlds, when we're in uh, places that are subtler after leaving the body in between birth times, et cetera, that we're training the soul to be able to recognize divinity. And that we're, by, in other words, by calling out and by asking for anything good to help us, Slowly, we come to have personal knowledge of the whole of which we are a part, or God. And at that time, then what happens is we're, because we're able to see God, wherever we may go through the transmigration process that still has to play out or that's currently playing out, we don't lose our way. We don't get lost that because we're cultivating that kind of vision to see what we're a part of, what is real and what isn't. Hermes says, each soul's hope of eternal life rests in his life here on earth. But people don't believe that. They see this as an empty story to be laughed at. Earthly things are too pleasant. Pleasure grips us by the throat. He says our possessions possess us. And so if you tell most people, um, why do I do astrology? Well, because I, you know, I believe that I'm, in a sense, I'm lo locked in a somewhat delusional place thinking that I'm separate from God and not really knowing my spiritual self. And I'm hoping to um, develop that relationship more so that I can be part of the harmony of divinity and, uh, you know, go back home to the spiritual world. You tell people that and they're like, yeah, that's just like, okay. So you're like, you're like a religious fanatic. Do you know what I mean? But um, it, just think about it for a second. Um, how is it possible that astrology can be so real and so accurate predictively like, I, I mean, again, like thousands and thousands of clients and I, you know, regularly every week can use the power of astrology, use the birth chart to predict amazingly accurate things about the past, about the present, about the future, very specific sometimes, sometimes a little bit more general, but I could say, you know, this year is going to be really difficult for your relationship. Or I can say something very specific, like, you know, your cat, like doing horary charts, like your, your missing cow is in a field to the Southwest near an enclosure. And there it is next to a red barn or something. So like it, if you put any faith or any stock in astrology, then you have to take seriously what kind of underlying reality supports the reality of astrology. And, and so the, one of the reasons, again, that I'm presenting all of this, that, yeah, it's intense stuff, right? It's, it's, weighty to think about all of this, to think that, uh, you know, in some ways we're ignorant of our true selves or whatever, um, you know, because it feels overwhelming. It feels really overwhelming as to have to deal with it. And it gets pretty heavy, right? Like Hermes is saying, the body is foreign to our true, true selves. A soul with no inner vision is, is blind. Uh, we're tossed around by the passions of the body. It feels like we're burning on burning and uh, we're burning up or we're on fire or we're a slave to the body. 
Hermes is, is using really graphic language, but he's really describing the situations that we encounter all the time in life. We try and try and try and try, hoping that something will work and make us happy. And it does sometimes for a little while, but then it, it's difficult to maintain. It goes away quickly. It leaves us. And Hermes is saying, like, this is just no way to live. And eventually an, a, an intelligent soul starts realizing this and starts saying, like, I'm on fire. This sucks. Like, where is the real happiness? Where is the, you know? Some people take up a philosophical view to try and get away from this saying, well, this is all there is, right? It's not entirely different from people saying, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's all just one. So both have a way out of having to deal with the immediacy of the problem, the individuality of the problem. Um, Instead of seeing the individual nature of the problem as um, the promise of an individual answer to the problem, a personal answer to the problem, People like to go out the impersonal route and just say, well, that's just how things are. Nothing really means anything. There's nothing that comes after this. It's all just like chemicals in a a soup. Or people say, yeah, it's all just one. It's all your God, I'm God. Just don't worry about it. Like that. Both are very lazy responses to the problem of personal suffering, of the, the personal nature of the soul and its journey. So at any rate, um, Remember, even though Hermes says the body is even foreign to our true selves, at other places in the Hermetica, Hermes tells us that we're to treat our body like a temple. So it's housing the soul. The basic idea here is that it's only foreign to us insofar as it's becoming the master rather than uh, the higher self being the master. Because we see this repeated when Hermes says that um, that we should not be a slave to the body and that the, the uh, when the body is in charge of everything, that it's like having a robber in the house of the soul, just looting and plundering all your stuff, right? So Hermes tells us, enjoins us, tear off this cloak of shadows, this web of ignorance, these shackles of decay, this living death, this conscious corpse, this portable tomb. He says, don't be born downstream by the waves of, of uh, you know, societal and material influence that just say, yeah, this is all just normal. Just eat, drink, and be happy for tomorrow. You will die. Just, there's nothing greater. You can't do anything about it. It's the, come on, that's impossible. That's too, come on. You don't know that. That's just, no, come on. Being born downstream. Uh, Hermes says, make use of the backflow. What's the backflow? The backflow is the way of slowly separating ourselves and moving back upstream to our source, to the, to the lake that flows, that the river flows forth from, so to speak. So we're to make use of the back currents that can take us back to God, back to our part of being part of the whole, fully conscious of our role in divinity. Seek the safe haven of liberation, anchor there and find a guide to lead you to the house of knowledge where you will see with the heart the brilliant brightness. If you only say, I cannot know, or I am afraid, or it is impossible to ascend to heaven, then what have you to do with a tum? Are you saying, you know, if your attitude is like, oh, it's too hard. I can't possibly know anything of a higher nature. We're so small. It's all just a big mystery. Or I'm afraid, like I, I, I'm what, you know, this feels like a lot. Or it's impossible. That's just, that's ridiculous. That's like, you're just like hyper ambitious. You're trying to like, you know, become perfect. No, it's not. Hermes never says that the soul is trying to become perfect. He says that the soul is trying to know what it really is and to sing its true song. That's a very different image than perfection. And it's one that motivates me because when I really feel my soul in those fleeting moments that I really feel my soul, it feels like a song that's only mine, that's, that's given to me, that's bestowed upon me, and that is looking for its place to sing within a, a choir, an, an assembly of other souls who have their songs too. Like that to me is very, very beautiful. And it's not a, an image of grueling, you know, perfectionism. It's not, that's not what I see or feel about it anyway. He says, wake your sleeping soul. You're drunk with ignorance of a tum and you're now vomiting it up. In other words, in some ways, the material lifetime that we live in delusion of our role in divinity is like a kind of sickness. And the experiences that we have that we go through that are difficult and painful, trying to find happiness and never really being satisfied that those experiences are like a kind of sickness and that the experiences can be seen almost like a kind of vomiting, a purging, that we're purging ourselves of all kinds of misdirected or misguided desires, intentions. So finally, he says, there is no greater mistake in life than to have the power to know a tum and to not use it. 
That's what's unique about the human lifetime is that we have this amazing gift of self-reflectiveness. We went over this in previous chapters. And he says, look, it's actually really easy. All you have to do is have the sincere desire in your heart, just as natural. Like the other day I was watching, I was, I was doing my morning meditation, which I do every single morning. And my dog came in, my wife had let the dog out to run early in the morning. She goes out pretty early in the garden and the dog came back in and like ran to the water bowl and was drinking, 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 drinking. And I had that, you know, I was doing my japa and I was kind of, you know, in, in a bit of a trance and I had this feeling of, yes, like the soul is thirsty like that. That was an, that's an honest response when you're th- so thirsty. So what Hermes is telling us is all you have to do is be authentically thirsty. It, and, and if you can have, you have to be authentically thirsty and then you have to have patience and you have to keep being thirsty and keep trying to drink, you know, and, and, and quench the thirst because he says, all you have to do is simply wish and hope to know God, to know your part of God, and it leads you straight on the right path. It may not seem like it right away. It may feel like you're still wandering. It may feel like you're going through stuff, but little by little, you will make it, and guides will appear to help you, and, and you'll be spoken to in dreams, and you'll, your life will have a way of speaking to you. Why? Because when you start seeking uh, divinity, one of the first realizations you have is that divinity can speak to you through anyone and everything because divinity is everything, right? So when you, this is how, and then you start to see divinity in everything. And that's when you start to see divinity in yourself. And that's when you start to ascend into understanding your role as a part of the divine whole. So Hermes is very simply saying, all you have to do is start wishing and hoping to, to know your part your, your, your divine nature. And then it just starts happening. It, 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 and it goes along, of course, in the East, they tell us sadhana is very important. Sadhana means spiritual practice, uh, calling out to God and, and, and desiring to know divinity uh, is a practice for most people. It, you have to do it consciously. You have to, you know, it's even though, uh, you know, practice is kind of, you know, boring or grueling or, you know, people don't like discipline and all of that. But um, because it's not natural to us, because it's much easier to go, you know, eat like a whole cheesecake or something. <laughs> like we have to, in some ways, train ourselves to stay focused on that desire, that intention, even and, and try to channel any emotions we have around the process right into that hope and that wishing for it. I'm bored. I don't like this. This is difficult. Channel all of it in. Just channel all of those feelings and those frustrations right into the process and say, that's, it's difficult. It's frustrating. You think about George Harrison's song, My Sweet Lord. He says, <clears throat> I really want to know you, but it takes so long. It takes so long. <laughs> you know, that, and, and that, but that's the mood. You know, that's the mood of, the, of, of devotion. And Hermes, again, says ultimately our place is to find our song and to find our service, our, our service to the whole. So uh, we have to keep with it. That's what Hermes is telling us. And as soon as we do, we find that uh, God is talking to us through lots of things and guiding us along and helping us find our true selves. Okay, so this has been a bit of a sermon today. Um, but really, you know, when you read these, these texts, I mean, these are like super cosmic, multidimensional sermons from Hermes. So, you know, that's what I like to read. I, it fill, fills my heart with the, all the good reminders that I need to start um, walking my path in the way that I know I need to. So I hope that's doing this for you as well. And if nothing else, giving you some good philosophical things to think about with regard to the uh, ancient practice of astrology. So we will be back. We have a couple of more episodes. We're almost done. We have two more uh, chapters to come in, uh, actually four more total, sorry. Uh, The next two are called Knowledge of Autumn and Rebirth. So we'll be talking about those next episode. I hope you have a great uh, day today and uh, that you will continue to read along with the book because you'll get a lot more out of it if you do. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye.